All right, so we are starting our series through the Gospel of Mark this morning. It's going to take us probably through the rest of this year, maybe with a couple brief breaks here and there. And the title of the series is King and Cross, the Gospel According to Mark. Okay, I want to just explain that title briefly here before we dive in to Mark chapter 1. So the book of Mark breaks down kind of... Uh, roughly into two parts. Chapters 1 to 8, chapters 9 to 16. Need to get a little more nuanced and say that chapter 8 is actually a hinge. Okay? And it swings on what happens in 827. Do you remember when Jesus says to his disciples, so the first half is all about the identity of Jesus, the second half about his mission. Okay? And certainly there's identity in the latter half and mission in the former half. But again, we're kind of painting with broad brush here as an introduction. So in chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Identity, right? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. And then Jesus goes on to say, yes, and I'm going to suffer and die. And Peter doesn't totally understand, right? Because he rebukes Jesus. That's not what a Messiah is supposed to do. And so there's surprises in both the first half on the identity of Jesus and there's surprises in the second half on the mission of Jesus. This is the king, but he's not the kind of king you expected. He's not the Messiah you expected. They expected a political military ruler. And here is the son of God in the flesh. And he's humble and meek. And he's going to, second half, die for the sins of the people. So, identity, king, mission, cross, both are surprising. That's why we're going with king and cross. Now, the subheading is the gospel according to Mark. This is just a little kind of sidebar thing. It's not the gospel of Mark, actually. So it's not his gospel. Okay, gospel became a genre after the four gospel accounts that we have. Okay, the point is there's actually one gospel and there's four eyewitness testimonies. So it's the gospel, the gospel, according to Mark. Mark's perspective. The gospel, according to Luke. The gospel, according to John. You see? So, in case you're wondering, (laughs) there you go. Um, One gospel, four eyewitnesses, all emphasizing different things, and Mark's gospel is the shortest, and we'll see some of the reasons why for that as we go through it. Um, We should consider the author here for at least a few minutes here as we get started. Tradition holds that Peter, the Apostle Peter, was the source for John Mark, okay, his full name, John Mark. He goes by um, Mark here in the title. But tradition holds that Peter was the source for John Mark. Papias, who was the bishop of Hierapolis in around 120 AD in his work titled The Exegesis of the Lord's Oracles, stated that John Mark was the writer for Peter, wrote down as much as possible of Peter's words. He wasn't an eyewitness, okay? Although he actually was there We'll get to that in chapter 14. He was there when um, Jesus was taken away to be tried and crucified. And Papias says that Mark desired to be careful not to omit or misrepresent anything that Peter had said. Um, By the way, Papias learned he was a disciple of the Apostle John. So this is like really close testimony here. Um, There are other historians that also attest to John Mark being the author of of the gospel according to Mark because you don't see a name anywhere, like an author's name, right? Did you notice that? There's no author's name. It just goes right into it. So um, basically we have Peter's memoirs here. It was most likely penned in the mid to late 50s, though it could have been as late as the mid 60s, but likely Mark is actually the earliest gospel Some people hold that Matthew is the earliest one. Most likely, Mark is. Okay, so who was Mark? In Acts 13, 13, John Mark bailed on 
Paul and, and Barnabas in Perga and went back to Jerusalem. Seems like he kind of got scared, he freaked out, whatever it was, we're not exactly sure, but he bailed on them, which led to a parting of the ways. At the end of Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas planned to return and visit some of the believers in every city where they previously proclaimed the gospel. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. And look at Acts 15, beginning in verse 37. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, it's between Paul and Barnabas, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And then there's like no mention of John Mark for 10 years in the New Testament. But then, toward the end of Paul's life, Colossians 4.10, the end of the book of Colossians, it says this, Aristarchus, Paul writes, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And then in Philemon, he's mentioned at the end, so greetings from Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And then finally, the last book we have from the pen of the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Luke alone is with me. So Paul's in prison. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. So there is gospel grace behind the scenes in the life and restoration of this gospel writer. Isn't that encouraging? I mean, Peter denies Jesus and then becomes a pillar of the church. Here's Mark who bailed when the heat got turned up and he is the writer of one of our gospel accounts and also certainly was restored um, with the Apostle Paul by the end of his life. So gospel grace even behind the scenes. All right, here we go. So five points this morning. Um, outline will, will be here on the screen here if you want to follow along that way. So first point, verse number one, so it begins, Mark 1.1. 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So like I mentioned, Mark's gospel is the shortest gospel account. And with that, there's actually more of a focus on what Jesus does like he's a man of action and a man on a mission. There's not as much focus, and I mean this in comparison with the other gospel accounts, on what Jesus says. Certainly there's plenty of his words recorded, but it's much more focused on his actions, what he does. Mark does not start this gospel account by focusing on Jesus' genealogy or his family history like Matthew and Luke do, right? He doesn't start with like a deep theological dive, you know, on the deity and humanity of Jesus like John's gospel account does. He starts more simply and just gets right to it, gets right to the point. Here is the beginning. Think echoes of Genesis. Of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, which is huge. Again, identity is going to be in focus here in the first half of the book, right? Well, this mention in verse 1 has a bookend. If you want to flip back to the end of Mark's account, chapter 15, verse 39, Jesus at the cross breathes his last, and the centurion, a Greek soldier, Roman soldier, when he saw he, how he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. So the son of God on this bookend, son of God on this bookend, um, the identity of Jesus is gonna be central here. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means that this gospel account is about Jesus. He's the subject, he's the hero. But if we keep reading, Next Sunday, Chris Elliott is going to preach on 114 to 120, and we see that Jesus is actually preaching the gospel. 
Maybe we're just so familiar with the Gospels that we don't stop and think, um, wait a second, that's a little weird. Isn't the good news Jesus dying on the cross for our sins? How can he be proclaiming the gospel before he even does it? What would his first listeners have been thinking about? So when this was written, the word gospel was not like a technical term for an account of Jesus' life. You know, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of John, okay? It was the word of hope that came on the lips of a messenger that was sent. Okay, we usually think of the cross when we think of the gospel, right? Well, what was Jesus actually proclaiming? How could Jesus preach the gospel before the content of the gospel was accomplished? What would the first readers have thought when they heard this word? Well, you heard gospel once in the passage that Lynn read, Isaiah 40, verse 9. Well, keep going in Isaiah. Turn back to Isaiah. Keep your finger in, in Mark chapter 1 and turn back to Isaiah chapter 52 just so that we can get into the shoes of first century readers, listeners. You know, what was their expectation of what the gospel was? What did it mean? So Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. There's our word. Who publishes peace. Look at the things that are parallel or synonymous with it. Brings good news, publishes peace, brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So the gospel is tied to the kingship of God. He is the king. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of Yahweh to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For Yahweh has comforted his people. Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Yahweh has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So Isaiah, the latter half, is being written to people in exile. They're under the thumb of Babylon. So for God to come and show up and deliver them and restore them to their land in freedom was salvation and peace and happiness. It was the throwing down the destruction of the enemies and the setting them free and establishing them in their home and land. So the Old Testament good news is connected with the saving work of God. Judging the enemies, saving the people, He's showing up to help his people, to rescue them, to deliver them. Another example in the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 14. Yahweh has given commandment about you. The you is Nineveh, okay, capital of Assyria, which was, you know, serious enemy of Yahweh and his people. No more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave, for you are vile. These wicked Assyrians. They were so cruel and unjust. And yeah, God's going to judge them. And then Nahum 1.15 says, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through. He is utterly cut off. So you see how the good news, the things that are associated with it, are the judgment on the enemies and the deliverance for God's people. So do you see how that's just like perfect background set up for what Jesus is coming to do? Judge Satan and sin, not the Romans, and deliver people from sin. So 
good summary here of the good news that the elders are reading a book called um, Telling a Better Story, How to Talk About God in a Skeptical Age. It's been a really encouraging, helpful book by a guy named Joshua Chatra. I don't know how to say his last name. C-H-A-T-R-A-W. Um, but here's what he writes. The good news is not a series of abstract beliefs or an ideology or a list of rules to follow to be good people. While other religious solutions claim to offer salvation through obedience to a great prophet or spiritual guru, the Christian story hinges on an event. The good news is a person. God himself entered our world as a man, offering forgiveness that transforms the broken and turns rebels into sons and daughters. To pay for sin and to mend the wounded, he bore on the cross the cost of rebellion. To defeat evil, he absorbed the worst of the malevolent powers of this world. While we ran away, Jesus came running to us with the Father's love. The good news is grace. So it begins. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here is where good news begins. Imagine, listen, we can't grow dull to the gospel by repeated hearing. Imagine where we would be without Jesus. Take some time this afternoon to just think of where you would be, where we would be without Jesus. Now listen, it is easy. It's easy, sadly, very easy for me especially when I'm trying to take out an old dishwasher that went out and put in a new one yesterday. More on that later. Um, sometimes I realize how unsanctified I am when stuff like this happens. Um, it is really easy to live as if the good news is not tr true, as if we don't have good news. It's easy to let our busyness blind us to reality or our sufferings or our struggles can eclipse the gospel. And we're kind of living down here rather than beholding our God seated on the throne. He cares for us. And he's taking the nails for us. But listen, because of Jesus, there is a gospel even when we're not happy about it. There's a gospel even when we're not feeling it, the effects of it, the power of it. There is an event that happened that is outside of us that actually anchors us, that we can return to when we've been blinded and lost sight. Listen, the fact that the gospel is not, you know, a series of abstract principles or things we've got to do, climb a ladder to heaven. No, it's God coming down and rescuing us from ourselves and from our sin, from hell, from the judgment we deserve. That means that it's outside of us. And so even when we lose sight of reality, we can come back. It means that texts like Lamentations 3.21 and following are true for us. Oh, this I call to mind when I've been blinded and, you know, wandering. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. His faithfulness is great. Why? Why is that promise mine? Because of Jesus. Because of an event. God is still for me, not against me, not because I had my devotions and checked off the box this morning, but because Jesus died for me. So our, like, temporary wandering, our, you know, getting blinded and allowing things to eclipse the cross don't make it untrue. So we can return to it and there's forgiveness for our failures. The cross means that 1 John 1, 9 is true no matter how much forgiveness you needed this past week. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, my children, I write these things that you may not, not sin, but if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And our performance up and down doesn't take him away. It doesn't undo the event. I mean, aren't you glad? 
Aren't you thankful for Jesus? <laughs> Romans 8 is true no matter, you know, the kind of yo-yo roller coaster of our day. So, the gospel is proclaimed by Jesus and it's accomplished by Jesus, but we can also say that the gospel is <laughs> Jesus. The gospel is about Jesus himself. Yes, he preached it, but he accomplished it. He is the good news of the gospel. So, in the beginning, God. <laughs> in the beginning, God created, and now in the beginning of the gospel, Jesus, the Son of God, is going to show us who God is and then he's going to die for us so that we can be reconciled to God. So we're going to move on now to point number two, but don't miss the connection with verse one, with point number one. So point number two is the forerunner foretold, verses two and three. The beginning of the gospel starts with the forerunner and the forerunner was foretold. So Mark goes back to Isaiah. Do you see? So as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. In other words, get ready. God is coming. Get ready. The Lord is coming. So Lynn read Isaiah 40. I want you to go back there again so you see what's being quoted and see what it means for it to be quoted in this way here in Mark 1. So, after the exile, God is, he's judged his people. They've received just punishment for their sins and now he's gonna speak comfort and he's going to give them the hope of restoration and return so look at Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice cries. In the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it, the glory, together. So get ready, God's coming. The glory of Yahweh will be revealed and everyone's going to see that glory. So John the Baptist says, get ready, Yahweh's coming. And Jesus shows up. God in the flesh. Again, we can't just grow, oh yeah, I know. <gasps> oh, yeah. <laughs> This changes everything. This is earth shaking. What do you mean? The only God. He doesn't share his glory with another. He is in the flesh like God is on earth. That's what the prophecy was. The messenger would come in the wilderness, prepare the way, and God's going to show up. And then Jesus shows up. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the radiance of God's glory. If you want to know God, look at Jesus. To see him is to see the Father. And all flesh shall see it together. Again, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, the messenger prepares the way. The people get ready. God's coming. How do you get ready? Point number three. Preparing the way, verses four to eight. So, John appeared Here's the messenger, okay? Back to verse two. Behold, my, send my messenger, and John appears. He's the messenger. Baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, listen. Again, we're so familiar with this. Baptism by another was actually abnormal. Usually ritual purification with water was something that was self-applied. Ritual baths and washings, hand washing and so forth. Here it must be performed by another. Also, 
this is, it's possible that this is also kind of underneath here. John the Baptist appears in the wilderness preaching this baptism of repentance, which basically places all Jews on the level of Gentile unbelievers. So when non-Jews wanted to be like folded into Israel, wanted to be part of the people of God, they underwent proselyte baptism in order to become a part of the people of God and avoid the coming judgment. So being baptized here by John meant you were recognizing your need for repentance, for purification in order to be ready to receive your king. Do you see why the Pharisees chafed at this? They didn't get baptized. We don't need to be baptized. We're holy. We're righteous. So, preparation. How do you get ready for God to come? Here's John with this baptism of repentance. Verse 6. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair. That's kind of weird. That doesn't sound comfortable. Like wearing a you know, a potato sack or something like that. I don't know what that feels like, camel's hair. Um, and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Is there any purpose to those details? <laughs> What's the, well, actually there are. There is. John the Baptist is an Elijah figure. That's why this clothing is mentioned. In 2 Kings 1.8, it says this. They answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So Elijah is like one of the prophets, you know, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, like one of the prophets of the Old Testament. And also there are allusions to Elijah coming again as the messenger to prepare the way of the Lord. In Malachi 3, it says this, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. And then Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. They expected Elijah to return. And the point is, John is the Elijah-like figure that's coming to fulfill these prophecies to prepare the way of the Lord. And you can tell even by his getup, by his attire, that he is that Elijah-like figure. Verse 7, and he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we've heard this, many of us, and it's easy to just blow by this. We know that, you know, untying a sandal was like a job too low for an Israelite, and it's kind of a humbling, humiliating job, and so, well, yeah, but listen, what this is saying is that's how great Jesus is. There's no one like him. So, give us eyes to see, Lord, as we go through the Gospel of Mark, as we go through this passage right now, Help us really see your glory in the face of Jesus so that we adore him, that we love him, that we magnify his name, that we just want to follow him wherever he leads us. His identity, his worth, who he is, is all over the place in Mark's gospel. We just need eyes to see it. Because here, listen, John the Baptist was a great man. He was held in high esteem by all the people. Do you remember when Jesus was asked um, later on in his ministry where he got his authority? And he said, I'll answer you, but let me ask you a question first. You answer my question, I'll answer yours. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And the Pharisees are like, well, if we say from heaven, then he's going to say, well, why didn't you believe it? If we say from man, the people are not going to like that because they held John in such high esteem. They might stone us. So it's that guy, <laughs> this great man, and he's saying, I'm not even worthy to do the lowest, 
most menial job. I am nothing compared to the one who's coming. I am nothing compared to the one who's coming. He must increase, I must decrease. I am just getting ready for him. You need to get your eyes on him. You need to be ready for him. And by John's own admission, his baptism was simply a, a precursor. It was preparatory. It was provisional. What the people and what we ultimately need needed was baptism with the Holy Spirit. So yes, confession and repentance is important, necessary, but on its own, like if Jesus hadn't lived and died and rose again, what good is that baptism of John? On its own, it's not enough. It's merely preparatory for the real work of salvation and then the real application of that work by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, washing you from the inside out and making you new. So you need to know who is coming and you need to be baptized by him, by the Holy Spirit. That baptism of the Holy Spirit is so beautifully described in Titus 3. I think we have it. Yep, there it is. So Titus 3, verses 4 to 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, of God our Savior, appeared. <laughs> Isn't that a great way to talk about the incarnation? and the presence of Christ on earth, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life life. When that internal baptism of the Holy Spirit renewal washing takes place, then of course you should go public with that faith, with that newness, and be baptized. We do it back there. There's water. Well, there would be on a baptism Sunday morning. It's empty right now. Um, so it's a public declaration this is what God has done by his spirit in my life. And I am going public. I'm with Jesus. I'm his. I'm new because of his grace and mercy and because of the work on the cross. So that's the baptism we need. But what about Jesus' baptism? Point number four, the significance of Jesus' baptism, verses 9 to 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. What? Why would Jesus need to be baptized by John? I mean, what is this baptism all about? It's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Did Jesus have any sins to repent of? No. No. Matthew's account gives us a little more help. In Matthew 3.13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to reverse the roles here. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. So why did Jesus need to be baptized by John? Well, certainly it was a seal of approval on John's ministry. This really is the messenger. This is the forerunner. He is the Elijah that prepares the way for the Lord. And I have come. And it shows his solidarity with the people he came to save. He, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So on the cross, the great exchange takes place, right? My sin, he bears it. His righteousness is imputed to me. Well, the baptism of Jesus is part and parcel with that. He came to live and die for sinful people. So he is fully identifying with us. 
He is doing so in order to fully represent us, in order to be our substitute, in order to redeem and reconcile us to the Father. So yes, it was necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did what, like you can imagine people would have maybe read that wrong. You can imagine the whispers. He despised all the shame. He'd already lived under the cloud of, you know, being an illegitimate child. <laughs> a little more gossip doesn't matter. I, I'm a man on a mission here and I'm gonna accomplish that mission. It just, we need to see what Jesus has done for us. It's all for us. I love Hebrews chapter two. Why don't you turn there briefly here, Hebrews 2, 14. So that you see this identification with us so that he can represent us in our place, so that he can be the substitute for us, so that we can be saved, reconciled to God. Hebrews 2, verse 14, 14 to 18. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, he himself likewise partook of the same things, flesh and blood, that through his death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, if he's going to help human beings, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Do you see how sweet, like what a rich well of grace and compassion and mercy and sympathy it is that Jesus took on flesh and blood. And look at what he, the reason why he did it. Because he wanted to kill death. Aren't you glad Jesus came to destroy death and to deliver us from fear of death? And then he came to destroy the devil who has the power of death flesh and blood and baptism and everything identifying with us fully so that he could fully save us. Verse, back to verse 10 in Mark chapter one. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. There is a ton here, okay? And I think maybe it would be best to go ahead and move on to point five and look at the significance of both the baptism and the temptation in the wilderness of Jesus together, okay? So we're gonna just hit pause here, move on to point five, read verses 12 and 13, and then try to tie it all together, okay? Wilderness temptation, verses 12 and 13. So the significance of the baptism, what's that? The significance of the wilderness temptation, what's that? Here's the wilderness temptation, verse 12. The Spirit immediately, right after God the Father says, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased, the Spirit immediately thrust him, drove him out into the wilderness. And when you hear wilderness, don't think of forest. Think a desert, <laughs> okay? drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. So the messenger comes, prepare for the Lord, the Lord comes and you'd kind of expect a hero's welcome, right? But there's no grand reception, there's no celebration, instead there's suffering. Jesus is driven out into the wilderness to suffer. What's the meaning of all this? Okay, let's put it together with the baptism. Uh, helpful quote from Tim Keller here is a good summary. In Genesis, he writes, the spirit moves over the face of the waters. God speaks the world into being. Humanity is created and history is launched. What's the very next thing that happens? 
Satan tempts the first human beings. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now here in Mark, the spirit, the water, God speaks, a new humanity, history is altered, and immediately the pattern continues with Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Listen, the wilderness is a battleground. This is a showdown with the destroyer of creation. Here's what we need to see. Adam was the first one to be called the son of God. Right? Adam fell. He failed. And what happened? He was exiled. And outside the Garden of Eden, thorns and thistles, it's like a wilderness. In fact, judgment language in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament in particular, oftentimes has these connotations of, you know, the wilderness where it, there's just, you cannot flourish, you cannot survive, it's dangerous, and it's just the opposite of the garden. So the first son of God, Adam, fell, was exiled, thorns and thistles. And then God calls Abraham. It's like a new humanity, a new people, his people. And they end up in Egypt. And be, through the patriarchs, the, the sons of um, Israel, he's going to form a new people. But they end up in, in Egypt. He brings them out. That's the second place that someone's called the son of God. Israel. Okay, do you remember in Exodus 4? Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. In Hosea as well, God says of his people, out of Egypt I called my son. Okay, so Adam, son of God, failed. Israel, son of God, failed in the wilderness temptation in the wilderness testing, right? And now Jesus, the Son of God, is driven out into the wilderness and the battle against the powers of darkness begins. Because again, 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So this cosmic battle has begun. The beginning of the gospel means showdown with the forces of darkness, forces of evil. So listen, so what? what? What do we make of this? So last night, as I said, I was trying to install a new dishwasher because our old one died. And the kids were watching a Spider-Man movie, the most recent one. And I've seen that before. And, you know, um, things weren't going so well in the kitchen. Um, but I kind of was tracking a little bit, you know, because you hear parts of it and... In this version, this iteration of Spider-Man, um, boy, some of those villains, one in particular, the character development is such that you just, oh, you hate what he does, who he is, and the carnage that he leaves in his wake. And you just want him to get his just desserts. You want him to be dealt with. And, you know, Spider-Man's the hero, right? And Spider-Man makes a very significant sacrifice at the end in order to set things right. And I'm in the kitchen. Kids don't actually even know this. I'm like tearing up in the kitchen because I knew what was happening. I'm not ashamed to say it. Okay. But why, why does that happen? Even if you don't have the same experience, maybe you can at least just try to identify with me here. Um, why does that happen? Why are so many hero movies or superhero movies or whatever when, man, the villain is teased out, good character development, you just long for justice to come. You long for rescue to happen. And when it does, doesn't your heart just thrill? Like swells, you're so like, you want that resolution to come. You want the hero to show up and set things right and rescue from all this mess. Listen, 
Adam and Eve bear their guilt. But Satan is the villain in this universe. Like, there's so much wreckage and pain and carnage and mess in this world all over the place. We experience it all the time. We've personally experienced it. We see it on the news. We grow weary of it. Listen, God has come. And that adversary, that Satan, is behind everything that went wrong with this world. So much pain and suffering and evil and injustice and on and on and on. Don't you want God to show up and set things right and rescue us? Set things to right? Well, first, thankfully, he didn't just come and destroy all the evil. Because guess what? We'd all be destroyed. Because evil runs through like Sol- Dostoevsky, Solzhenitsyn, whoever it was. It runs right through here, the center of each human heart. So if God comes to deal with evil decisively in one shot, we're all toast. But he came first to bear our punishment. That doesn't mean to take away all suffering. That day is coming. But there's mercy in the meantime. But God has come and he will come again. Like we've Sung, prayed, you will reign forever. He's already started. It's already begun. The, go- the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let your glory fill the earth. Your kingdom come more and more and more. Don't you long for that to happen. So I, I love this quote by Donald McLeod, and I'll close with this, and then we'll transition to the table. Every year, the world and the church experiences Christmas, okay, that curious amalgam of paganism, commercialism, and Christianity which Western civilization had invented to tide it over the darkest days of the winter. Christmas is a lost opportunity, a time when the world invites the church to speak and she, pl- the, she blushes, smiles, and mutters a few banalities with which the world is already perfectly familiar from its own stock of cliches and nursery rhymes. And then he says this. No, Christmas is instead the perforation of history by one from eternity, the intrusion and eruption of the eternal into the existence of man. This is earth-shaking. Let's not let our familiarity breed an indifference or just like a dullness. Let's pray as we go through the gospel of Mark. We want to behold your glory. Give us eyes to see how great and worthy and wonderful and merciful and gracious and loving you are so that we thrill, our hearts swell. He's come, he's here. The cure has already begun. The renewal has already begun. And he's gonna come again and set everything to rights soon and very soon. Let's pray. The team can come up and they'll pray quietly as we prepare our hearts to participate in the table. If you did not pick up a cuppy, uh, a cuppy. (laughs) Wow, I don't even know what I was thinking there. Okay, if you did not pick up a packet, the little communion packet, you can run back and grab one now. But let's pray and prepare our hearts to participate in the table. Oh God, we have such good news. You are a good news God. We, where would we be without you? What, like, utter hopelessness and despair. And yet that is not reality for us, for all who are trusting in Jesus as Savior. So if there's anybody who doesn't yet trust him, who hasn't seen, hasn't had their eyes open to see their need and Jesus' perfect provision for our need, would you do it now? Open their eyes now. Cause them to trust in Jesus. Run to him and ask for forgiveness and cleansing and enjoy this reconciliation. Peace with you. And Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, don't let anything eclipse the gospel. Would you remind us now and remind us this week and help us to live in the light of your glorious face that shines on us with grace and mercy because of the cross. Lord, feed us now 
Strengthen us now as we participate in the table, as we eat and drink and celebrate and give thanks for the body of Jesus given for us, the blood of Jesus shed for us so that we have a gospel, so that we have good news, so that we have you. What we need to confess and if there's something we need to get right with another brother or sister, help us to consider the body and the unity that this table makes possible and where we need to deal with some breach that we've made help us to go do that even if we have to step out and Lord do feed us and strengthen us by your grace all blood bought in Jesus name Amen Amen